Hey YouTube, good evening. Welcome back to my shop. My name's Rich. So tonight we're going to have the uh, third installment of an occasional series that I call The Anatomy Of, where we look at an old tool or piece of machinery, one that I think is kind of interesting or unusual, and we're just going to go through and take a look at the machine, see how it works, uh, talk a little bit about the history of the machine, and uh, that's going to be it. So tonight we've actually got brothers here in the shop. Um, this machine right here is a vertical. This machine right here is a horizontal milling machine built by a company called Hamilton Associates out of Baltimore, Maryland. And uh, this is a machine I picked up recently in an auction. And at that same auction, I picked up his brother, which is this Hamilton vertical milling machine. And we'll talk about both of them tonight. So we're going to start with the horizontal milling machine. So it's it's a fairly traditional uh, milling machine in terms of you know how it's designed. Um, there's a table and a cross light here. There's a knee for the elevation. And then it's got a spindle and an overarm support. And then in the back is the drive gears. So just for scale, this machine is a bit smaller than it appears at first. Um, there's a cold beverage to give you an idea of how, how truly tiny this machine is. Uh, this machine uses a number one Morse taper spindle and uh, the arbors it uses are uh, half-inch arbors for the cutters here. So, um, you know, it's, it's tiny, it's really designed for model making. Um, I tried to do a bunch of research on these machines before I bought them and really didn't find much information about them at all on the internet. Uh, I found a little bit, of, a little bit of information about the lathes that they manufactured. Um, also one of the lathes that's sitting over here next to it, it's, it's sort of half disassembled right now. And um, the lathes were unusual in that the milling part of this machine, really the knee assembly and, and, and the, uh, the overarm support, were available as an option for the lathe. And the lathe has a uh, pivoting headstock so that you can swing the headstock around and do milling on the left hand end of the machine. So kind of an unusual setup. Uh, this lathe isn't equipped with that. Um, obviously the original owner on this machine bought um, a standalone version of it. My understanding is that these machines were marketed primarily towards uh, schools, which I think probably goes a long way towards explaining the relative rarity, um, because they, you know, they're small, lightweight machines, and I imagine that very few of them survived the ordeal of, uh, of life at a school. So uh, this machine's got a 3.5 inch by 14 inch table, and uh, it's got a f the original third horsepower motor on it. And I'll bring you around the back and show you. The drive system on these is kind of unusual. Um, it uses a little tiny belt to be able to squeeze a bunch of extra speeds into the machine. And other than that, I mean, it's, it's fairly conventional. So, you know, the knee elevation is over here on the side, like, like you would see on, you know, most small milling machines. Um, it's got a decent amount of travel back and forth on both the table and the cross slide. And the, uh, the lead screw for the, for the table extends down through the base. So you need to mount this on a bench with a hole in it, obviously. Um, this is the original chip pan that came with this, so there's a hole in it and there's some mounting bolts on there. Um, but it's kind of a cool, cool little machine. It's, it's certainly, you know, diminutive to say the least. But um, I fired it up and, and did a couple of test cuts on it. And uh, it seems to run pretty well. There, it runs fairly quietly. Most of the noise you hear there really is the uh, belt guard rattling around a little bit. Um, but it's smooth and it's got a pretty good wide range of speeds for it. Um, so that you can go out there and you can mill some, some decent psych material. I wouldn't be, you know, hogging off tons of steel with it, but for plastic and aluminum and brass, um, you know, I think it'll do a fine job. So let me, let me bring you around the side here and just show you a little bit more detail about the machine and how it looks, and we'll uh, kind of go from there. So when I bought these machines, um, the previous owner had been using them primarily for woodworking, and they, were, they had been kind of neglected but not abused. Uh, there was a lot of sawdust and pitch and whatnot gumming up all the ways. Uh, the jibs were horribly out of adjustment. You could grab the knee and the table and, and wobble them all around. And uh, you know, really not something you want to do any metal cutting with, certainly, to get any precision. Um, you know, despite the, the, the way they looked when I, when I got them, you know, a quick inspection showed that they, they seemed to be in fairly decent condition. And after a couple hours of disassembly and cleaning, um, I put these back together again, and they're actually in really excellent shape. I don't know if you can see it in, in this shot here. Maybe I'll show you another shot. But the, uh, 
The table itself is in great condition. There's like one or two little nicks on it here. You can still see the milling marks were from, from when it was manufactured. Um, both mills have the original vices with them, which is kind of nice that those, you know, those kinds of things tend to get lost over the years. And then uh, this one had the arbor, along with quite a few of the original spacers that had the keyway cut in them um, to be able to mount and space your cutter. And then I, manu I manufactured uh, one or two additional ones just to be able to, to add some space. The, when, I, when I got this machine, let's see if I can grab it here. Um, <clears throat> it had these fairly large inch and a half brown and sharp cutters mounted on it, which in my opinion for certainly doing any metal working is probably a bit oversized. Um, you know, maybe for light cuts in aluminum, but for woodwork, I imagine it got the job done pretty well. So I just put a, a little slitting saw on here just for now, just to kind of get it set up and test it, and I need to take up some more space on the arbor. Um, the spindle is threaded. I haven't measured that yet, but it looks like it's about an inch and a half by ten. Um, so you could put a chuck on there if you wanted to. And uh, like I said, it's set up for a number one Morse taper. There is a drawbar, quarter twenty drawbar that goes in the back that pulls the taper in and uh, the taper itself is in great condition. So let me just uh, bring around the side here and show you a bit more. So here's just a quick shot of the, uh, of the tag on here. So it's Hamilton Associates Inc, Baltimore, Maryland, USA. Uh, my understanding is that the company is still in business but no longer in the business of manufacturing machine tools. And I don't know much about the history of this machine. The auctioneer that I got it from said that the uh, most recent owner uh, had been a shop teacher and which kind of makes sense since these things went to schools. And I found some cutters that were with the machine that were engraved uh, Poughkeepsie Trade School. So my guess is that's probably where they where they spent at least part of their life. Um, but it doesn't appear that they spent a long time there because these machines don't show the typical signs that you see of machines that have been used in schools. Um, the vices aren't all scarred up with, with horrible cuts and the tables aren't all drilled into. Um, they, they've been pretty well cared for. Uh, when I got the machine, uh, this machine had some electrical problems. The switch wasn't really working right. Um, it's a simple general electric, you know, pushed on off uh, motor starter switch. So I took that apart and cleaned it and adjusted the contacts and that was working good. And then there's a dead man switch. Um, I don't know if you can see that in this shot here. On the back where the motor guard uh, mounts right here. That essentially turns the machine off or won't let the machine start uh, if the belt guard is taken off. And that was wired on the uh, neutral side between the switch and the motor. So I went ahead and switched that around and, and mounted it on the, uh, on the hot between the power and the switch. You know, it's kind of a silly feature, I think, in, in most shops. I guess for a school it makes sense. But if you're going to have a switch, you might as well have it wired properly. So here you can see the drive pulley. Uh, so I'll, I'll get a better shot of this, I guess. But you can see there's eight speeds on these on these pulleys and there, there are these little tiny grooves that uses a belt that's about uh, maybe a quarter of an inch wide at most and the idea was to be able to get a, a useful number of speeds um, with a small amount of space and there's no back ears or anything like that so this one doesn't have a counter shaft uh, just to do the speed reduction but it's a single speed between the counter shaft pulley and the motor and then there's, uh, there's eight speeds on the pulleys themselves so let me go on the other side and I'll show you how that's set up. So here's a look at the back of the machine. So here's the, here's the motor with the single, uh, the single drive, single slot pulley. And then this is the counter shaft pulley uh, that it drives. And then that actually feeds the pulley that drives the spindle. This is the uh, draw bar for the, uh, for the spindle for putting in, uh, like I said, number one Morse taper tooling. So it's a pretty well designed machine in my opinion. Um, you know, it seems reasonably rigid for its, for its tiny size. Um, the, the speed range seems pretty reasonable for the type of and size of cutters that you might want to run on this machine. And uh, this is in my shop temporarily. This is going to be probably looking for a new home before too long. And I imagine that this will find a, a welcome home in somebody's shop that does a lot of model making or maybe building small steam engines, um, things like that. So that's really it for the horizontal machine. Let's try that again. That's it for the horizontal milling machine. Um, let me reset up again and I will show you the vertical mill. Okay, so here's the other, here's the brother. This is the uh, Hamilton vertical milling machine. Um, the, the knee assembly and the table and, and those parts uh, all appear identical to the other horizontal mill. And obviously they, you know, they reuse those parts for economy. 
Um, this also has a number one Morse taper in the spindle and has a similar um, drive system with the little miniature belt. So let me pull a little closer here and just give you a little look at that stuff. Um, in terms of the way this machine operates, it's fairly similar to other small knee mills. Uh, I have a Clausing 8520, which is about, oh, I don't know, four or five times the size of this, but uh, still maybe a quarter the size of like a full-size bridge port. Um, and, you know, again, there's your, there's your scale for that machine, so you can see it's pretty tiny. And so, again, you know, it's got the, it's got the elevation for the knee here, and then it's got a, uh, a down feed here for, this, for the quill. And there's stops on here, so you can set a stop for the quill. And then it's got a, it's got a same type mechanism that the, that Clausen used on that, where there's some pins here, uh, there's a pin here rather on the quill handle, and there's some holes bored in this little disc here, so you can kind of bring it up and engage it at any point, and you just slide it in, and then you can operate the quill with that. But you got to get it, actually get it engaged, right? So you can go up and down like that. And then there's a, a lock over here that you can lock the quill. Um, there's locks on, on all the tables and all the knees. Um, it's a pretty well thought out, well designed machine. Um, you know, it's not like it's a toy, it's just small. So let me spin it around here. And I'll show you the drive system on this guy as well. Let me fire up. So again, runs nice and smooth, nice and quiet. Um, all the bearings in these machines are pretty good. These machines are manufactured, at least my understanding is, in the 1950s and 1960s. So, you know, this machine is probably somewhere in the, in the vicinity of 50 years old. And uh, it still runs pretty nice. So again, you know, pretty similar setup. A um, little bit different in terms of there's a single speed um, between the, the spindle drive here and the countershaft pulley. And then you've got the, the step pulleys here on the motor and on the countershaft. Um, this machine also was just filthy dirty when I got it. If you guys are like me and you like dragging home uh, disgusting, greasy, grimy old machinery, I highly recommend you run to your local box store and pick up some of this Zep heavy duty floor stripper. Um, this is concentrated. I use it at about 12 to 1 for degreasing machines. Um, it's like 10 bucks for a whole gallon of this stuff. And I find that it does a really, really good job of cutting the grease. Um, it's pretty easy on the paint. If the paint is in even reasonably good shape at all, um, it won't take it off. You know, occasionally you get a little coloration on the rag. Um, but it's, it's great stuff, and it's certainly an awful lot cheaper than using brake cleaner or other stuff, you know, other things like that. And uh, I, just, I just mix it up in a spray bottle and, and go to town. Um, what else was I going to say? So, you know, you can adjust this, the, uh, the whole head assembly here so you can move it back and forth to get alignment on the table. You can actually tilt it side to side. Um, 90 degrees in either direction, so it gives you a lot of flexibility. If you wanted to, if you didn't have the horizontal milling machine and you need to do some horizontal milling, you could you could rock this over to the side and, and turn the cutter that way. Um, obviously, the downside of that is <clears throat> every time you, you loosen these bolts and you move this head, you need to go back and, and retrain it to zero. Um, there's a scale on there, but you know that's not really going to be good enough. And uh, what else? This machine also has the same uh, arrangement with the um, with the guard on it so that there's a dead man switch so when you take the guard off the machine stops again it's a safety feature that I don't know is really necessarily that valuable but uh, it does exist so that's really it for these two um, I'll give you a quick teaser of the lathe uh, right now it's in a state of uh, I would say more than partial I would say mostly disassembled um, unfortunately the lathe um, was originally equipped it's the same pulley system as the milling machines have with the little tiny uh, narrow belt and the eight-step pulleys. Uh, that's gone missing on this machine somewhere along the years. So right now there's a mismatched uh, set of uh, three-step pulleys. I'm going to see if I can find a, a set of four-step pulleys that I can get to fit this machine or at least make fit it um, to give it kind of a useful range. Like I said, this one doesn't have the milling attachment. And, uh, I've got it all torn down. The tailstock is about done, cleaned up, ready to go, all adjusted. Um, I got the carriage and the compound about three quarters of the way done. And this machine, um, I'll just show you real quick. I actually made another video on this, but it uses a, a, a single half nut. Oh, is this even in frame? It uses a single half nut that when you when you uh, engage the leather the lever back and forth here, um, it moves it up and down. It hits the lead screw. This was completely worn out. So um, I spent a better part of an evening or two in the shop 
uh, making a replacement for that. These machines, like I said, are pretty rare. Um, I, I found almost no information on there. You know, I searched eBay to see if any had come and gone in the last six months and found nothing. So I assumed that parts availability was going to be pretty much non-existent. So rather than spend a lifetime hunting down a part that's, that's never going to show up, um, I just went ahead and made one. And it was, a, it was a reasonably simple job made complicated by my lack of expertise. So anyway, um, that's it for tonight. Uh, appreciate watching. If you like what you see, I hope you'll subscribe and I hope you click the like button. Everybody have a great evening and be safe in the shop.